Good morning, everybody. Today we're going to talk about the Internet Protocol Suite. We talked about Ethernet last time, although that was a long time ago. Ethernet tends to be the local area networking protocol, and the Internet Protocol Suite, it does wide area networking for us. So remember, we talked about protocols and said that protocols are rules for communicating. The TCP IP, that is Transmission Control Protocol and Internet Protocol, is the basic transport protocol for the Internet. So TCP IP is the protocol that moves the bits around on the Internet. If you look at a website, you're using the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP or maybe HTTPS, the one that encrypts. That is a higher level protocol that uses TCP IP for transportation. So we up here we have the web protocol doing whatever web protocols do. And then down at the next level we have TCP IP doing, doing the moving around of bits. And so we call TCP IP a lower level protocol and HTTP a higher level protocol. So logically, the connection looks like this. Two applications talk to each other, and as far as the application is concerned, that's the conversation, one application talking to another application. What really happens is each application talks to an application program interface, and in this case, it's something called a TCP socket. Uh, a socket, in this case, is software. It isn't really a plug that you plug something into. Okay? The two TCP sockets provide a connection between the two applications. The connection looks to the application like a pipe. Bits go in one end and come out the other end. The physical link I have chose to represent by a duck because on top of the water, the duck floats along nice and easy, but there's a lot of paddling going on underneath. And there's a lot of paddling going on underneath with TCP IP as well. The OSI model is the seven layer model um, over on the left of the slide in the hot pink. That's really supposed to be magenta or something, but it's hot pink. Starting at the, at the physical, at the bottom, there is the physical layer, then the data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, and application layer. The internet model protocol stack completely ignores layers one and two. It recognizes that they have to exist to get bits from one place to another, but the internet model does not define those layers. It just says we, we got to have them. The middle three of the OSI model, network, transport, and session, are done with two layers in the internet model, the internet protocol or IP layer, and then either TCP, the transmission control protocol, or UDP, the user datagram protocol. There are a couple of others that can fit in there as well, but the big ones are TCP or UDP. Then at presentation and application, we have the internet applications, SMTP for mail, HTTP for web, Telnet for connecting computer sessions, and so on. So the internet model is much simpler than the OSI model. Okay. TCP based on five protocol layers, we don't really define or specify one layers one and two, the physical layers. The TCP protocol suite includes a whole bunch of protocols, the slide says numerous, that work together for, for communication across the internet. So here is that TCP stack again. Up at the top, the application layer, something like HTTP for web, there are a bunch of other applications. Going down, the transport layer, TCP, UDP, or Stream Control Transport Protocol, SCTV. Routing layer, 
mostly what is there in the routing layer is IP, the internet protocol. We'll talk about all of these in, in detail as we go along. ICMP is the internet control message protocol. It is the protocol you're using when you use the ping application. DHCP for configuration and ARP for address resolution. Down at the bottom, the two blocks say depends on underlying network. This is the data link layer and the physical layer. The internet model does not define either of those. It just says they've got to be there. And that is why we can use ethernet or cellular radio or Wi-Fi radio or even something like infrared to move bits from one place to another physically and still operate the three upper layers of the TCP IP stack. It does not care how the data link and physical layers work, only that they have to be there. So here is sort of expansion of that business that I showed you earlier where the two applications are talking to each other. Up at the top at the message level, applications behave as though they are connected directly to one another. Your web browser sends an HTTP GET request, and that is received by the web server. And all of the rest of that stuff is the duck paddling around underneath. What really happens is the application layer talks to the transport layer through that API. The two transport layers, good morning, the two transport layers virtually talk to each other. Physically, they both talk to the network layer. The two network layers talk to each other virtually. And notice at the transport layer, the message got encapsulated into a TCP header. So I've got a TCP header and then I've got message. And at the network layer, the TCP header and message got encapsulated into an IP header. So I've got now IP, TCP, and message nesting like Russian dolls or something. At the data link layer, assuming Ethernet, we put that whole package into an Ethernet frame with an Ethernet header. Now the two data link layers virtually talk to each other, but physically they talk to the physical layer, and the actual connection is in the physical links down at the bottom of the diagram. So I told you there was a lot of paddling going on underneath, and there it is. Layer 5, top layer application layer, that is where messages are created or consumed. The slide says created, but obviously one, one side of the application will create a message and the other side will consume it. Any application that provides software that communicates with the network layer. So any of the communicating applications, and there are a bunch of them. Sockets originated with the Berkeley Systems Division Unix in, in looking for a way to standardize the interface to all of that duck paddling that's going on. They provide the interface between the application layer and the transport layer and everything else, really. Um, the application calls the API, the socket API, to initiate a connection and also calls the API to send messages and receive messages. That gives us a way of adding new protocols. So I mentioned the SCTP, the stream control protocol. That's new relatively. TCP and UDP were the original two. But we could add SCTP without changing a whole bunch of stuff because of the way this is done in layers. Transport layer provides reliable end-to-end -end communications. It generates the final address, and we're talking about logical addresses, IP addresses, or IPv6 addresses. It handles all of the end-to-end -end communication. Now, there's a lot of other stuff going on. We're likely to go through a whole bunch of routers from one end to the other but the transport layer is responsible for all of that end-to-end -end communication. It does the packetization of the message. We talked about packets last time, which was a long time ago. That is, we're gonna take a message which might be a 
you know, four gigabyte download and break it up into packets of 1,500 or so bytes each. There are two major protocols. TCP is the transmission control protocol. It is a reliable protocol in the sense that packets get acknowledged. UDP, the user datagram protocol, is unreliable in the sense that packets do not get acknowledged. And that makes UDP faster. We don't have to wait for that acknowledgement. Okay, TCP, reliable delivery service, sending and receiving node, each create a socket and then communicate through that socket. There is a full duplex connection. Full duplex means that both applications or each of the two end applications can send and receive at the same time. Messages move in both directions simultaneously. A single TCP circuit a service can create multiple connections. And we do that by creating multiple sockets. Now, it's kind of interesting. If you think about it for just a minute, you fire up your web browser and open six tabs to go look at the six things that are interesting to you. You've got six HTTP connections going on all at the same time. And that is okay because the protocols keep all of that data separate for you. Routing, actually getting the packet from one place to another, is the responsibility of a lower layer, in this case the network layer. UDP is unreliable in the sense that messages do not get acknowledged and connectionless. The, the analogy that I like to use is you put a message in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and drop it in the mail. There's no concept of a connection there, and there's no acknowledgement. But, except for recently, you could be very confident that the Postal Service would deliver that envelope where it was supposed to be within a reasonable amount of time. With UDP, you can be pretty confident that the underlying network protocols will deliver that so-called datagram where it's supposed to go within a reasonable amount of time. No acknowledgement of receipt. Um, streaming video works with UDP. And here's the scoop about that. If you miss a 1500 byte video packet, you might see a little blip, but probably you won't notice it at all. In other words, we are better off not acknowledging packets and slowing everything down than we are doing reliable acknowledged communications. We get the speed we need for video, and if a packet is lost, it's kind of not a big deal. If a bunch of packets are lost, it suddenly becomes a big deal, but that doesn't usually happen. Okay. So postal service, reliable or unreliable? Um, the postal service before the pandemic, let, let us consider, okay? Because I got to tell you, the, the postal service today is struggling a little bit. In an unreliable connection, the protocol does not provide any indication that a packet was delivered. In a reliable connection, the protocol does provide feedback. That is... The receiving station gets a packet and sends an acknowledgement. So we say the, the receiving station sends back and I got it. TCP is reliable. Packets get numbered with a sequence number and acknowledged by sequence number. UDP is unreliable in the sense that there isn't any acknowledgement. It works. It's not unreliable in the everyday sense of that word. It is unreliable in the sense that there is no indication if something went wrong. Okay, the TCP handshake is the way that client and server, that is the two communicating ends, agree on sequence numbers. 
We can't just start with sequence number one, because if we could do that, the bad guys could predict sequence numbers. And if the bad guys can predict sequence numbers, they can send packets pretending to be us. So the TCP handshake is how we agree on sequence numbers. The client opens the connection to the server, the server's sitting there waiting, and sends a randomly selected sequence number. The server replies with its own randomly selected sequence number and also the client's sequence number plus one. So the client can now say, I know the server got my message because it gave me back my sequence number with a one added to it. And now I know what the server's sequence, starting sequence number should be. The client replies with the, the server's sequence number plus one in the first data packet, and now we're communicating. And the sequence numbers get plus one every time a packet is exchanged. At the network layer, this is also called the internetworking layer or IP layer, that is responsible for addressing and routing. That's how packets get from point A to point B. IP, but not TCP, TCP is a higher level protocol. IP provides unreliable, there's no acknowledgement, connectionless, there's no concept of a conversation, unreliable connectionless packet switching. The reliable part, the connection-oriented part, those happen at the TCP layer. It does not guarantee delivery of packets. It doesn't check for errors, but that's okay because TCP is going to do both of those things. Routers and gateways, and we did talk about routers and gateways last time, are sometimes referred to as level three switches to indicate the level at which routing takes place. Routing happens at level three of this TCP IP stack. Data link layer, that is responsible for getting packets between two adjacent nodes. So think about your home network. Uh, your computer probably speaks either ethernet or Wi-Fi wireless ethernet. The connection into your home might be a digital subscriber line. It might be something else these days. Mine happens to be a satellite link. I have no idea what the communication protocol on the satellite link is, but I don't have to care. That's the neat thing about it. The data link layer provides reliable, in this case it gets acknowledgement, acknowledged, uh, transmission of packets between adjacent nodes. So in, in my home network, the Ethernet packets from my laptop get reliably delivered to the device that is the gateway to that satellite antenna, okay? And then there's another data link layer between the satellite antenna and a satellite up there, another data link layer between the satellite and the downlink, another data link layer between the downlink and um, a tier one internetwork and so on. So if you, if you actually mapped the path that a packet took, you're gonna find bunches of nodes. Okay, packets at that layer are called frames. Um, they sometimes get divided into logical link control and physical control, medium access control. Mostly all of that happens in, in one package these days. Logical link control provides for error correction by attaching error correcting codes to the packets. Flow control, flow control is a way of putting some back pressure on a connection if it is transmitting faster than the receiving end can process. Retransmission, that is send it again, assembling, reassembling packets. Mostly that all happens in hardware now. The medium access control layer is the procedure for accessing whatever the transmission channel is, whether it's ethernet or Wi-Fi or cellular, for detecting errors and for dealing with data encoding, collision handling, sequencing, and multiplexing. 
multiplexing means sending more than one message stream across the same transmission medium. The physical layer, these are actually the, the connection, the wire, the radio channel, the fiber optic cable. Primarily implemented in hardware in that network interface controller. Medium access control protocol defines the medium. So there's a different medium access protocol for cellular radio data than there is for ethernet. But the upper layer protocols don't have to care. Defines the signaling mechanism, how the signals, how the signals are parameterized, that is how they're used, carrier frequencies, pulses, synchronization, timing, all of the duck paddling we have to have to make things work. And it defines the method that physically connects the computer to the transmission medium. That is why you can buy an Ethernet cable and it fits the socket. All of that stuff has been standardized. Okay, at the application layer, we're talking about addresses. We use a human-friendly address like www.kennesaw.edu. And we might use a port number. Like those sockets, which, are, which exist entirely in software and are not anything that you could physically plug something into, port numbers exist entirely in software and are not anything you could physically plug something into. Right, at the network layer, we use a logical address, that is an IP address or an IPv6 address. At the physical layer, we use that medium access control address. We talked about those when we talked about Ethernet. Okay, domain names. This is, this is an easy one. The domain name system is a hierarchical system of address identifiers. And it's used both on the internet and on local networks. This is the thing that prevents us from having to memorize IP addresses. Now you can memorize five or six IPv4 addresses um, if you use them regularly. I probably can't memorize even one IPv6 address. There's a whole lot of, of bits in there. They're encoded as hex digits, but there's a lot of them. So we assign a name instead. I have heard the domain name system described, analogized as a phone directory for the internet. You have a name and it looks up the number. The principal service of the domain name system is to translate domain names into IP addresses. It does some other things too, but that its main reason for existing is to turn a human friendly name into a less human friendly IP address. Um, it can go the other way too sometimes, can sometimes turn an IP address into a domain name, that is look up what domain belongs to the address, and can provide some other services. It is a huge database, there's an entry for every domain that exists, and there are a lot of them. It's a distributed database, and we'll talk about how that works in just a moment. There is a hierarchy. Up at the top, there is the root domain. It doesn't have a name. If we, if we need to refer to the root domain, we use the period character, the dot. The top-level domains, and there are several hundred of them now, .com, .edu, .org, and so on. The second-level domains, these belong to organizations. So .kennesaw is a second-level domain. Uh, .gotech is a second-level domain. And then below the second-level domains, there can be subdomains, and I'll show you an example in a few minutes. But usually what is there is hosts. So reading from the bottom, we have host www in second level domain Kennesaw, dot, Kennesaw in top level domain edu, and then the root knows how to find all of those. In the, the color coding here, and man, that ran off the edge. A host name, an optional subdomain, 
And then the top level, I'm sorry, the second level domain and finally the top level domain. So www.kennesaw.edu is a host name, a second level domain name, and a top level domain name. Tobler.ai.mit.edu.ai is a subdomain, and Tobler is the server. www.ducksoup.comedy.marksbrothers.com um, has two subdomains, comedy and within comedy, uh, duck soup. Mostly we don't do that. Um, one subdomain is usually enough. The abbreviation F. QDN, which you might come across as you read about domain names, stands for a fully qualified domain name. That means you give it all the parts, the host name, the subdomain if it's present, the second level domain, and the top level domain. I have not tried it here, but if, if the KSU network system is configured correctly, you should be able to reach and please don't try it now, just stick with me, okay? You should be able to reach www.kennesaw.edu by just typing www. And the network configuration says, well, I'm in the kennesaw.edu domain, so that must be what this guy's after. If it's not what you're after, then you have to have that fully qualified domain name, that FQDN. Okay. We started out with the so-called generic top-level domain names. Generic does not mean they come in a plain white box. It means that they describe the genera or the type of organization. So .com for commercial. .net used to be reserved only for operation of the network. It is now kind of open to everyone. .org for nonprofits. .edu for degree granting institutions. Dot mil for the military, dot gov, and so on. Then, as the internet expanded outside of the United States, country codes, top level domains, dot au for Australia, dot br for Brazil, and so on. Now, down there, third from the bottom, dot md, that is Moldova. And the Moldovans have realized that that is a great natural resource. You can, and probably all of you know this, license a .net or .com domain for 10 or 15 bucks a year. If you want a .md domain name, the last I looked, they were charging 300 bucks. And medical doctors, drbrown.md, right? Tuvalu is an Island Kingdom, I think, still in the Pacific. Dot TV. You find US TV stations with a dot TV domain name. Um, dot FM, Federated States of Micronesia, is also mining that natural resource and selling domain names to FM radio stations. And then there are a bunch of newly invented extension TLDs, and there are hundreds of them. Dot arrow for airlines, dot museum, dot dentist, uh, dot everything you can think of. So that's where those come from. The database itself is distributed. The root servers, and there are a bunch of them, know how to find dot com, dot org, dot edu, and the rest of them. The top-level domain servers, and there are a bunch of those, know how to find KSU, MIT, .tech, and so on. And then every organization with a domain name must run at least two domain name servers. And the Kennesaw uh, domain name server knows how to find things like www and faculty web. So several layers of servers. There are 13 root server names, a.rootservers.net to m.rootservers.net, but through a technique known as anycasting, there are 1,700 physical machines spread around the world. 
and your request for a.rootservers.net will go to one that is geographically close to you. And this is good. How do we find the addresses of a.rootservers.net? Those are, quote, well-known, unquote. And what well-known means is that they're compiled into operating systems. So your operating system has a list of those, well, really only 13 of them, I think, 13 root server addresses. If you can contact any root server, those, those root server addresses change very, very rarely, very infrequently. And if a machine can contact any one of them, it can get addresses for all the rest of them. The top-level domain servers know the addresses of name servers in their own domains, and the domain name servers know the addresses of hosts and subdomains. So the top-level domains are approved by the Internet Corporation for assigned names and numbers. And if it's not approved by ICANN, it doesn't count. Second-level domains are registered by accredited registrars. And the way the registration mechanism works is you can't register duplicate names. Only one Kennesaw.edu, but there could also be a Kennesaw.com in the .com top-level domain, and maybe even a Kennesaw.ero or .museum. It's up to the owners of each domain to be sure there are no duplicates within. So there can't be two WWWs within Kennesaw. Now, I can run multiple web servers and, and do load balancing, but in that case, the address needs to point to the load balancer. So only one WWW address. All the host names are local, that is, they are assigned by the domain name owner. How they get assigned is up to the domain name owner, but there's a standard that describes some well-known names. So www is standardly a web server, mail or SMTP is standardly a mail server, and so on. And most organizations follow that standard. They don't have to but it makes it easy to find, for example, an organization's web server. Well, let's look at how all of that stuff works. Some person sitting at the machine up on the, the right of the slide there wants to look up and talk to www.kennesaw.edu. So they ask the root name server, tell me about www.kennesaw.edu. And the root name server says, I don't know, ask the edu server, and here's, here's what glues all this together. It says, ask the edu server, and here's the address. So now the client there in the spotlight has the address of the edu server. And it says, tell me about www.kennesaw.edu. And the edu server says, I don't know, ask Kennesaw, and here's the address. That and here's the address piece is what glues it all together. So we say www.kennesaw.edu to the Kennesaw name server, and the Kennesaw name server says 20.122.241.50. Now we have the IP address of the www.kennesaw.edu web server. We're going to cache that address. That means we're going to save it so we can have multiple conversations without going through all of that DNS lookup again. The lookup process happens only once. The information in the, the domain name system headers tells how long a client can cache a, an address. And the reason for that is if I know that I'm not going to change addresses anytime soon, I might set that cache limit to a week. If I know that I'm going to renumber my network next week, I'll change the cache limit from a week to an hour. And a week later, after all of those one-week caches have, have timed out, I can now change things and everything will work relatively promptly. 
Well, pick an hour that's in the middle of the night so that it doesn't really bug anybody. Okay, IPv4 addresses, the ones that we're mostly used to, um, are registered and allocated by that internet corporation for assigned names and numbers. They're 32 bits long, which means the maximum number of them is 2 to the 32, which is about 4 billion. In the 1960s, the idea that there would be 4 billion machines connected to the internet was silly. Nobody could, could possibly imagine that, that sort of, of scale. Okay, they get assigned in blocks of contiguous addresses, and the size of a block is a power of two, divided into two levels, the network part and the host part. And we use this thing called a mask. A mask is nothing more than a string of zero and one bits to separate the different parts of the address. Okay, we're out of IPv4 addresses. Um, we've done a pretty good job. It was predicted we were gonna run out 25 or so years ago. But we used network address translation and reserved addresses and this thing called class, classless internet domain routing uh, to conserve addresses. And, and we did a good job of not running out when it was predicted. ICANN is out of large IPv4 blocks and has been for 15 years, 13 years. Regional registrars and internet service providers still have some addresses available. IPv6 was published in 1998, which is eons ago in, in terms of internet years. Dinosaurs roamed the earth and glaciers covered Georgia in 1998. 128-bit um, addresses, so there are two, two to the 128th of them. That is enough to assign an IP address to every grain of sand on the planet. We might run out of IPv6 addresses if we start colonizing space aggressively, but as long as we're stuck on this ball of dirt, we're good to go with IPv6. Eight groups of four hex digits, so 2001 colon DB8 colon 85A3 colon zero and so on. Uh, that's why I said these were hard to remember. Now, here is the sad thing about IPv6. It is not interoperable with IPv4. I can carry IPv6 packets on the same wires, but the addressing is, is just not interoperable at all. Effectively, we have two different networks with different addressing protocols running on the same physical equipment. And that is why IPv4 is still the most common addressing format. And I've been able to say that for many years and not been wrong. IPv4 and v6 can coexist with this thing called the dual stack implementation or whatever it is. The underlying transport provides either an IPv4 packet or an IPv6 packet, and you can tell them apart. If it's IPv4, it gets converted to the IPv6 format within the receiving machine and then passed on to either TCP or UDP and finally passed on to the application. Okay, not enough information in the IPv6 header to route all packets with all of the options so there are extension headers. And the extension headers include routing fragmentation, authentication, and a bunch of other stuff that you should not bother to memorize. Just remember that extension headers exist, and when you need to know about them, look up, look up what's in the extension headers. Now, if you were studying to be network architects, you'd need to know all this stuff. But for the general information technology degree, just remember that it exists and then you can find it when you need it. 
port addresses are 16-bit numbers, so 2 to the 16th of them, 65,536, and they're part of the TCP packet header. The port address is what the operating system and network software uses to identify the application that ought to receive the packet. The first 1,024 of them are called well-known because they are standard addresses for common applications. Port 80 is the standard address for HTTP, the web application. 443, which is still in that first 1024, is the standard address for HTTPS, the encrypted web application. Um, the rest of them, up 1025 and up, can be user-defined, although there are a bunch of them that are reserved. Here's, here is a list of, well, it's an example list of well-known port addresses. Do not memorize this. Look it up if you need it. Just know that they exist, okay? Now, how do I configure a network? Well, it has to have an IP address. It has to have that network mask that tells which of the bits are host bits, host address bits, and which are network address bits. It needs to know where to find the domain name servers. And this thing called a default gateway, usually that's all you have is the default gateway in a small network. But in a large network, there might be more than one gateway that goes different places. If I'm sitting in Kansas, I might have gateways that head west and other gateways that head east. Um, the default gateway is the address where packets with no specific explicit routing go. The dynamic host configuration protocol, DHCP, can configure all of that stuff. I have no idea how many devices there are in the KSU network, but thousands of them. There are dozens of them in this room. Obviously, one person or even a pretty sized group of people can't configure those. DHCP works this way. A computer wakes up, is powered on, becomes part of the network, and it says, sends a broadcast message, a message that, that does not have a specific destination address that says, hello, I need configuration information. And a DHCP server replies and provides a whole bunch of stuff, but including IP address network mask, domain name system servers, and default gateway. So the configuration is automatic, and the, the network administration task then becomes maintaining the DHCP server, not configuring thousands of individual workstations. So it manages a list of available addresses, uses broadcast and response, and it can distribute either reserved or registered addresses. A reserved address and we will mention them in a minute, I hope. A reserved address is, is one of networks out of 10 dot something something, 172 something something something, or 192, 168 something something. And these can be used in private networks and multiple folks can use addresses out of those same blocks. Registered addresses are those that you get from your ISP or from the Internet Corporation for assigned names and numbers. Um, everything else that we need in the configuration, such as network masks and default gateways, is also configured in the, D in the DHCP server, and it can then send that information to the hosts. There are reserved addresses and if we're going to use those, and that's mostly what we do, even, well, it's mostly what we do. I was going to say even in large networks, but almost always in home or small networks, and most of the time in large networks, we reserve, we use one of these reserved addresses. There must be some network address translation in the gateway. Or we can use a pool of registered addresses. Uh, those are scarce resources and are not used very often. 
the reserved addresses, now the slide says every computer address direct, attached directly to the internet must have a unique IP address. These computers are not attached to the internet. They're attached to the KSU local area network. And there's a router or gateway somewhere that is attached to the internet. And as the slide says, not every computer that uses the internet protocol has to be connected to the internet. So the reserved addresses are the 10 dot block, all addresses from 10.0.0.0 .0 .0 to 10.255.255.255. Um, 16 blocks in the 172 range and two to the 16th in 192.168. Okay, so many different organizations can use the same address range. Um, these addresses are sometimes called non-routable. They're just as routable as any other address, but the Internet Core routers will refuse to route them. They could be routed, but the Internet Core routers say, nah, I'm not routing this, drop on the floor. Okay, now we configure computers with IP addresses either by static configuration, if we're gluttons for punishment, or using DHCP. What we don't have is the MAC address. DNS gives out IP addresses, but communication on the local area network needs that Ethernet MAC address or the Wi-Fi MAC address or the cellular radio MAC address or whatever. Okay. I know an IP address, but I need the MAC address. I use the address resolution protocol, ARP. And it works like this. The destination IP is known somehow. Maybe we looked it up with DNS. But we don't know the destination MAC, and we can't talk to this device on the local network until we know that. The node wanting to communicate sends a broadcast message again containing the IP address. So it's a message that says, who has 10.2.3.4? The node with that IP address replies, I got it, I'm, it's me, 10.2.3.4, and that reply contains the MAC address. This is very cool. And now the original node can cache that MAC address in an IP to MAC table called the ARP table and use the MAC address to communicate. So here's a picture of that. Um, the ARP request is a broadcast request from whoever wants to know to everybody, but only the machine with the requested address replies. And once the reply is received, it's cached on either the host or the router. If you were interested in opening the command window of a Windows 10 or 11 machine, I checked this, it works on Windows 11. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't work on Windows 11. And I don't like that, but never mind about that. If you type ipconfig, it's going to tell you a lot about the current configuration. This particular machine, which I configured by hand just to make this slide, says it's at address 192.168.1.1, subnet mask 255.255.255.0. That means that the first 8, 16, 24 bits are our network address, and only the last 8 bits, that dot zero, is a host address. The default gateway is at host 138. Then I do ARP-A, and it tells me the contents of the cache, 192.168.1.18, is at that first physical address, and so on. Okay, network address translation. How are we doing for time? Plenty of time. Network address translation. All IPv4, actually all IP connections, are characterized by four numbers. The IP address, and it can be IPv4 or IPv6, port number of the source, uh, port number, IP address of the source, either flavor, port number of the source, IP address of the destination, and port number of the destination. If I know those four numbers, I can 
completely characterize an IP connection. The NAT router, which the routers on the KSU network and also on almost all of our home networks, has only one outside address signed by the ISP, but it's got 65,000 port numbers. And that means that it could be a proxy for up to 65,000 internal devices. In the router, there's a table that translates an outside connection to an inside connection by port number. I know that isn't clear, but there's a picture coming up. So if the source is 168.28.176.200 and port 80, the NAT router it says, all right, I recognize this and I'm going to use port 125. I'm going to re I receive it on port 1025 and I'm going to send it to internal device 32.port 49 or colon port 4096. And now that conversation with the addresses translated by the router can happen between the inside machine with the so-called non-routable address and another machine anywhere on the internet. So there's this appliance between computer and the outside and a table in the NAT router translates addresses. And there's a diagram there that if you care, you might want to study. For the purposes of this class, you need to know that NAT routers allow the use of reserved addresses. Don't need to know anything else. But listen, you're, one of you has given me the grin. When you know that, you know you what to look up when you have to deal with one of these. Nobody can hold all of information technology in his head or her head, as the case may be. But if we know what's out there, we can look it up when we need it. And that's what I'm trying to accomplish with this whole course, is telling you the stuff that you need to know and telling you what else up is out there so you can find it when you need it. If no one had ever said NAT router to you and you were asked to work on this thing, you couldn't do it. If you were asked today, you could. I'm telling you, you couldn't. If you were asked today, you might have some looking up to do, but you could figure that out. The other thing that a NAT router can do port forwarding, that is we're going to define some ports, and it says that anything that comes in, I'm looking at the blue arrows there, this is pre-configured in the router by somebody who's administering the router. Anything that comes in on port 25 is going to go to device 1 in our addressing mode and port 25 because it's mail, and it's going to go to our MTP server. Anything that comes in on port 80 goes to our web server, and here's a dynamic entry, the last one. If it comes in on port 96, it goes to device 3, port 1024. So what are the advantages? Um, internet activity using reserved addresses. I don't need those scarce registered addresses anymore. NATed computers are defended from unsolicited incoming packages if there was no port forwarding. Um, that is, the router, if I, if I sit down at a machine and type www.cnn.com, after all of the address looking up happens, I will make a connection to the IP address of the cnn.com machine. That's an outbound connection. The NAT router is going to remember that, and it knows how to deal with the response. The other side of that is Acme.com cannot, unless I've done port forwarding, open up a connection to me. The connection has to originate inside. Running servers behind a NAT router takes that port forwarding configuration, and there's no protection against solicited malicious data. So if you hit a malicious website, NAT does not help you a bit. IPv6 is a little bit different in this case, and I think I'm just not going to go into it here, okay? Um, quality of service 
is a mechanism for reserving priorities for different kinds of packets. So if I have email and web browsing and voice over IP, I want my VOIP packets to have top priority. Then I probably want the web browsing to be next because I'm sitting there waiting for it. And email can be last because I'll get to it when I get to it anyway. We can also get service guarantees from our carriers that specify a particular level of throughput. Now, ISPs that sell to people like you and me, they'll say up to 50 gigabits. So you're getting 12 megabits, right? And they say, yeah, but you can get up to 50. We didn't say you were always going to get that. Too bad we're keeping your money. But if you are buying service from level three or somebody like that, you can contract for levels of throughput. You can also use a differentiated service field in an IP header that sets the priority. There are other protocols. Um, we're not going to talk about them in any detail at all. MPLS, multi-protocol label switching, creates virtual circuits. Basically, all the uh, packets follow the same path. Asynchronous transfer mode is a mesh technology, high speed, but only small, tiny, 53-byte pa packets. Sonnet is a synchronous optical network for optic optical fiber. SDH, also for optical fiber, synchronous digital hierarchy. And frame relay, which probably still exists, but you don't need any, is a 56K bit per second wide area network standard. Virtual private networks are packet switched networks on a public network like the internet. And what makes them virtual and private is that the data are encrypted. So these are often described as a tunnel through the internet. There is no tunnel. The internet is carrying the packets just like any other packets, but someone who is capable of attaching a network analyzer and examining the packets can't see your data because it's encrypted. They can see the addresses. They can tell who you talk to because you can't encrypt the addresses or routing doesn't work. And there is this thing that I hope your security class will talk about called traffic analysis. If I know who someone is talking to, even if I don't know what they're saying, I can make some inferences about what they're up to. So high-speed networking, we're talking about gigabits, billions of bits per second, fiber optic cable, Ethernet. We can get gigabits out of Ethernet, ATM or Sonnet. This thing called wave division multiplexing, um, that is using more than one color of light in a fiber optic cable. And so I can modulate a red light and send data that way and modulate a blue light and send different data that way through the same fiber optic cable because it just carries light. Wave division multiplexing is also called lambda division multiplexing because the Greek letter lambda is used to represent wavelength. So how about speeds? Dial-up, I remember dial-up well. When we got to 56 KB from 300 bits per second, I thought I was in fat city. Eight megabits, megabytes, 2.4 minutes, 10 gig ethernet, eight ten thousandths of a second. In other words, before your finger is off of the enter key. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen and, and lady.